Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Dougald Close, and as the Head of the Discipline of Agriculture and Food Systems here at UTES, it's my great pleasure to open the third alumni lunchtime webinar. This will be presented by Associate Professor Tom Ross, University of Tasmania alumnus and microbiologist with the Tasmanian Institute of Agriculture within the School of Land and Food. The presentation today is on the topic of food safety. Is it rocket science or is it? Now it's an intriguing topic title, I know, and all will be revealed during the seminar, or should I say webinar. This webinar will form a living record of UTES achievement, which can be accessed from our website uh, uh, ongoing. A little bit about Tom. Tom's a food microbiologist specialising in mathematical modelling of the microbial ecology of foods. This is important science for innovation in food safety and food preservation. On the academic side, Tom is reasonably well qualified. He's written over 140 scientific papers and book chapters on food micro microbiology and has served on numerous expert committees concerned with food safety management for Australian government and industry organisations and international organisations such as the United Nations FAO and the WHO and also the US Food and Drug Administration. He was also appointed to the International Commission on Microbial Specifications for Foods in 2008. In 2014, he received the Keith Farrer Award for the Australian Institute of Food Science and Technology for achievements in research and education in food science. So you can see my comments about his qualifications are rather tongue-in-cheek. In addition to academic pursuits, Tom and his colleagues and team are heavily engaged with industry and the wider community. They develop mathematical models and science-based decision support software tools that are widely used and applied by the food industry and by governments in Australia and internationally, in addition to direct usage also incorporated into policy around food and food safety. Tom is also the director of the Australian Research Council Industrial Transformation Training Centre for Innovative Horticultural Products. I have the fortune of working under Tom as the director for this training centre and I can tell you he likes to crack the whip. No, only joking. He supervised or co-supervised 25 successful PhD students. Sometimes they need a bit of whip cracking, but, but generally not. Uh, most of whom who now work in industry or government. Tom is energetic in translating the results of science into practical outcomes, as I've outlined, and also believes strongly in the power of communication. He works closely with his students to ensure that they are trained in communicating to anyone about what science is about and why it's important. And I can say that Tom leads by example here. There have been many times, particularly in the early mornings, when I've heard him entertaining and educating, educating us via the local radio, but also through many other public events organised by UTES. A most important outcome from Tom and his team's work is that we can all enjoy fine and safe Tasmanian meat, seafood and cheese. Of course, these complement the very nice ciders beers and wines that our fantastic state produce as well, but that's another story. So with the housekeeping, so following Tom's formal presentation, we'll have time for some questions from listeners, so please sit back, learn, listen, post questions via the chat box underneath the presentation on your screen. Please note you will need to be logged in to live stream to use the chat facility. All of your questions will be visible to other listeners. Due to time constraints, we'll choose a selection of these uh, which we will manage at the conclusion of the presentation. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to Associate Professor Tom Ross. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Dougal. Thank you very much. And welcome to everybody who's joined the webinar. Um, thank you for the interest that you've shown and hopefully this will generate some questions and we can have a bit of a discussion at the end as well. So, to start with, yes, I did pick a hopefully kind of catchy title. Um, and I hope that by the end of the presentation you'll see why it's not just a gimmicky sort of gag, but part of it is as well. So to begin with, I've been lecturing here at the university for probably 10 or 12 years and when I first started as a food scientist I came across this quote and it was a, a food scientist from America who said food safety science is hardly rocket science. Well given that that's what I do I was a little bit offended and I thought well hang on, is that a true statement? Is it really that food safety is that simple? And the answer is in general yeah it is because as adults 
most of us have been taught that there are certain things we do to make sure that our food's safe and, and we see that in the way that the food industry works. We wrap food up or the food comes to us packaged. It's made in ways that minimise the, the spoilage process. It, it stops the growth of bacteria, so the formulation's important. In our own homes, we know that we need to cook or wash um, foods, but particularly to cook them because that kills those bad bacteria that might be there. If we're a little bit more trained in food safety, we know that if you mix raw foods like chicken and meat and fish, sometimes they still have bad bacteria on them. And if we transfer those bacteria from the raw food to other foods that we eat without cooking, we might get sick. The food we cook's okay, but if we transfer material from raw food to, to other foods, that can be a problem. But people know that. And we know about temperature control, that we need to keep food hot if we want it not to go off. As you see in a, a takeaway store, the food's always at 60 or 65 degrees or above so that it's ready to go. Or we use a fridge. Every home, we would think, has a fridge and we know that you use the fridge to extend the shelf life of foods. We know about personal hygiene. We know that we should be washing our hands after we go to the toilet because some of those bacteria grow in our guts and if we don't wash our hands properly, we can spread them around in our own homes to our friends and family or if we're a food worker, perhaps to clients, and that's not a good thing, but it still happens, which is a bit weird. And finally, there's a bit of a, a throwaway line that if you're in any doubt about the quality of the food, just throw it out. So these are all things we've all heard about and we should all be practising. So really, maybe right or was right. Maybe it is pretty straightforward. Except, despite that it seems to be straightforward, foodborne illness is still a big problem in the Australian community, and in fact in all of every developed country in the world, and probably even more so in the undeveloped countries. But let's stick with the developed countries for a minute because surely we've got the resources and technology and the knowledge to make food safe. But it doesn't work like that. So it's estimated that every year in Australia between four and five million people get some sort of foodborne illness. Most of that's mild and mostly you won't go to the doctor about it, but a number of cases are, and, and there's probably 20, 30, 40,000 cases that are severe enough that somebody goes to a hospital or even stays in the hospital, and every year there's probably 10 to 20 to 30 deaths from foodborne disease as well. So what's going wrong? It's both expensive for society, it's expensive for the individuals involved, it's expensive for business because they lose business as well. So there are a couple of reasons why this might be happening. And here's a list of them. One of the things that most people don't understand is the food that we eat often comes, well we probably do more recently because of some of the things in the news, that a lot of the food that we eat is produced in other parts of the world, in other countries, and we, we become a little bit worried about the standards of hygiene in some of those countries. But equally, more of the food is produced in single factories, so we have much larger scales of production, things are more centralised. So if something goes wrong in that factory, it tends to affect a lot more product and a lot more people. And as consumers, we've been conditioned to think that fresh food is better, a more natural product without preservatives is better for us. But without those preservatives and without that processing, it's very hard to be sure that we've eliminated all the potential bad bacteria that might be there. We also rely more on pre-prepared foods. We don't take individual responsibility for the safety of the foods that we eat. And as I said, the food business is now global. Foods are shipped around the world, they're in transit for longer, they're shipped around the country without um, extreme systems of preservation often they're just refrigerated fresh products spending two weeks on the road between the place of production and where we buy them in the supermarket and as I said foods are produced in different parts of the world under different conditions that maybe wouldn't satisfy the standards that we expect in Australia but there's also changes in farming practices that, that farming has become a lot more intensified and that can lead to different kinds of bacteria getting closer together, swapping genes and actually producing newer, nastier, more virulent kinds of bugs. As I said, we tend to forget because we buy most of our food in the supermarket and it looks fresh and clean and green and colourful and nice, but foods are actually produced in natural environments. They're in the sea, they're out on grassland, plants are produced in the soil itself. These aren't sterile sites. Each of those places where our food comes from has its own community of bacteria, most of which are harmless but some of which can cause us harm. There was a recent outbreak in Victoria from salad lettuce where about 50 to 100 people got ill with salmonellosis. It should never have happened because we know all the reasons how to stop that, but it did. Now we also know that sometimes you get hazards arising, these bad bacteria, unpredictably 
and you can't see them. So there's been so many outbreaks where people have said, this food looks fine. And it does, because the bacteria that are making you sick are microscopic and invisible, and they don't cause the food to go off in any way. They only cause problems when we ingest them, and then they start to grow in us, or sometimes if they grow in the food and produce nasty, toxic chemicals. So, all of these things are challenges for the modern food industry. It's much more complex. There's a lot more challenges. We have less weapons in the arsenal to make the food safe because we want fresher, more natural, wholesome foods. So what happens? Maybe, maybe we should just test more. But testing is expensive and testing for microbial hazards takes time. And if you can try and imagine this, as few as 10 bacteria in a serving of food, that's maybe 100 grams, could be enough to kill certain kinds of people, people with a particular predilection or perhaps young kids, they're often more susceptible. Now, we could find those bacteria, but we'd need to test a lot of product and it takes perhaps days to do that. So the problem is testing isn't really very effective and particularly when even one unit of contaminated food in 1,000 or even 10,000 is still considered to be unacceptable. The challenge is how do you find the one in 10,000? So as I said, we can detect these microbial hazards, but it takes time and money. The tests aren't particularly cheap and they require usually days of effort on the part of a trained scientist. But we're looking for things like needles in haystacks. And so the challenge is how much food do you have to test to be confident that it's safe enough? And the answer is simply the statistics work against you. As I said, those foods can be contaminated from all sorts of places, from the places where they're grown, from people who handle them, from the factory environments themselves, because these bacteria are small and it only takes one or two because once they get into the food, they can start to grow, or even once they get into you, only one or two can start to grow and to make us sick. But the trouble is it's these microbial hazards that are the biggest source of foodborne illness, both in Australia, in all the developed world, um, and most of the rest of the world as well. Now, there have been some notable exceptions, like melamine in infant baby formula, but really that was a one-off and those sorts of chemical contaminations are quite rare events. Conversely, microbial foodborne illness and foodborne outbreaks are relatively common. So we go back. This is very challenging now. This is not a simple thing that the simple rules can cover, unless we all take individual responsibility and sacrifice some of that idea of quality of freshness of food because it's very difficult to make fresh food that never contains pathogenic bacteria. So what does the food industry do? Well, in fact, it did take some ideas from the US space industry. And you might think that's unusual, but think about it for a minute. Rockets are essentially an explosion going off in a controlled sort of manner. So rocket propulsion, the whole space program, is all built around great big bombs that are pushing people up into space. The trouble is, that often goes wrong. And it has done on quite a few occasions. There's been a couple of shuttle missions that we've lost. We lost Apollo 1 on launch for various reasons. But failures of rockets is not that uncommon. There have been two private uh, rocket launches, or three I think, in the last couple of years around the world that have led to uh, explosion on launch. Which got the engineers in NASA way back thinking about how do you make a rocket that's absolutely safe when it can go so catastrophically wrong? And that's where this leads into um, lessons for food safety. So I need to perhaps give you a bit of an idea about the US space program. The Americans were lagging behind their Russian competitors till John F. Kennedy stood up and said, this isn't good enough, American pride is at stake. And he said that he believed that this nation, America, should commit itself to achieving the goal before the end of the decade, and he said this in about 1961 or 62, of getting a man onto the moon and bringing him safely back to Earth. And that process actually was successful in July, I think 21, 1969. They got there in about seven or eight years, from unmanned rockets to actually getting someone and people to the moon and back. But the whole reason for the missions was partly to get some American pride back, but also to boost American industry. So the business of building rockets is big, um, big engineering, big science, big projects. And so all the politicians said there's a lot of money from taxpayers being spent, and that money was distributed to all the different states so that everybody got a piece of the pie. So each state's businesses or business enterprises had some part to play in that. And then they would bring those components together at a central place, say Cape Canaveral or Cape Kennedy, and they would put the rocket together. And the question was, 
you've got quite a complex system of manufacturing, putting all these things together. How do you know that each single component is absolutely safe and fit for purpose? Because if you get it wrong, bad things happen on launch or just after launch. And so NASA and the engineers looked at this because they'd had these problems of rockets exploding on launch and said, we've got to be much more systematic about this. And they came up with this idea called failure modes effect and criticality analysis, which basically means you look at the process of all the components and all the synthesis of the components that goes into a rocket and work out which of those are most critical to the safe operation of the rocket. So again, you break the whole process of rocket construction and the component parts down, look at each one and say, if it fails, what could happen? What are the consequences? If it fails, how does it fail? How do we stop that from happening? So that you have a very proactive approach that says, we'll put most energy into quality control of this rocket building process to the components and the parts and the systems that if they fail, will have catastrophic outcomes. And so that's the idea that, that went into the building of rockets. Curiously, even after they started using that, there were a couple of notable failures that were actually expected to happen, and the challenge of disaster was one of those. In hindsight, people predicted the challenge of probably had a good chance of exploding on launch. But when we start putting people into space, there's another component in there as well, and that is the astronauts themselves. The astronauts in the early flight missions were a critical component too, because that final business of re-entry into the Earth's orbit, when there was the, the risk that the spaceship would burn up on re-entry, was actually guided by the pilots. The astronauts themselves would have to bring um, the capsules back in at the right orientation. Now, if for some reason that astronaut had some sort of illness and wasn't able to function normally, if his judgment were cloudy, if he had shaky hands, this could be a catastrophic event too, the failure of the, the astronauts themselves. And then they got to thinking, well, as these missions get longer, these guys have to eat in space. So what if the food that they eat contains pathogenic bacteria, the bacteria that make them sick? What happens if an astronaut who's got to guide this capsule back through the Earth's atmosphere has gastroenteritis and the shakes and blurry vision? So the astronauts themselves and their safety became a critical component and the food that they ate. So again, the longer the missions, the more risk came from the food that was being provided to the astronauts. So NASA then went to the businesses that were supplying food to the space program and said, what are we going to do? How do we make these foods absolutely safe so that a pilot never becomes ill? Because the other side of that is, imagine having gastroenteritis and vomiting and diarrhoea in the weightlessness of space, in a small capsule where there's nowhere to go. Not a pretty picture. So the food industry developed pretty much along the same lines as the engineers had done, a thing called hazard analysis critical control points. And basically, it's the same idea as fault failure modes effects analysis. It's looking at the production of food, looking where these bad bacteria could get into it, finding ways to make sure that they never survived, putting in place processes, controls, that said this food is absolutely guaranteed to be safe. And the success of that program was good enough that food industries around the world started to adopt it and it became the established food safety management philosophy for food production around the world. It's mandated by national governments around the world, it's been endorsed by international organisations, by UN organisations as well. So it's an idea that's taken off and it works because it's built on or based on building safety into the product, not trying to test the product at the end of the process to see whether you made it safe or not, because end product testing takes time and it's expensive. So again, just to go over it, this, this HACCP idea that's really come from thinking about rocket systems that have to be fail safe, the idea is to understand where hazards arise in food processes and food processing, and then putting in places, sorry, putting in place procedures that prevent those hazards from being present, control them or remove them. So control might mean making sure they never grow to levels that make you sick. So the idea is to make sure that the end product is free before you even start testing for it. So food companies do, do still test products, but again they test it more to convince themselves and, and um, give confidence that their processes are working properly. So again, it's a fairly simple idea. Understand about the hazards that could be present, understand where they come from, understand what you have to do to control them so that they're not present in the finished product that's going out into the market. And that's all well and good. 
except that whilst this is a basically simple logical and structured system about the hazards, it really requires an awful lot of expert knowledge. And that's because the bacteria, these microorganisms, are quite diverse. They're all a little bit different. In fact, they're all a lot different. There's more genetic diversity amongst the bacteria in the planet than the ones that cause human illness than there probably is amongst all the mammalian species on the planet itself. And because they're diverse, each one has its own particular set of characteristics. And if you want to do has HACCP properly, if you want to really create a safe food production system, you have to know enough about those potential hazards to know which ones are relevant to the food that you make, which ones can be controlled or how they can be controlled by the processes that you need to do. And ultimately, you need to understand about their potential to grow in the product after it's manufactured and so on. And again, they're really diverse. So you need a lot of knowledge, a lot of detailed knowledge about the physiology and the ecology of these microorganisms that could be present in foods and that might make you sick. So where does the science fit in? Well, it fits in in places like that. And again, what is it that the Food Safety Centre, what is it that the group that I'm part of does? Well, we know about the microbial ecology and physiology of those sorts of organisms and we try and use that to help businesses to design these HACCP schemes and HACCP plans that achieve the safety that they need but without wasting energy um, chasing um, after hazards that really aren't, aren't a problem. So the sort of science we do allows the food business to discriminate against, sorry, about the most important hazards and focus their attention on those and know about the ones that aren't really important to what they're doing. So as I said, we study microbial ecology to make food safer, particularly bacteria, and then we take that knowledge that we've got and try and make it available to the industry in things like predictive mathematical models and software, the sorts of things that Dougal introduced um, when, when he gave the introduction. But we use some fairly high-end mathematical techniques, things like stochastic risk assessment that's used in risk management for all sorts of projects around the world. The banking industry uses the same sort of mathematical modelling techniques, engineering projects, um, anything where there's a risk of failure of some kind. Um, and then we put it into software and into technologies and again, hopefully, to help minimise food safety risk. So that's nice. We've learnt from um, the rocket programs, the space programs, and we've taken what they've learnt to try and make food safer. safer. But it doesn't really end there. So again, if we think about where we started and putting people into space, there's a few other applications now where actually you need some fairly high-end knowledge to make these missions possible. And here's some pictures of the early space flight foods. And the first ones on the shorter missions um, were just little tubes of product that the astronaut had to suck out. Again, you're in a confined space, in weightlessness in space. If you spill your food, it just floats around the cabin. It's not a good look. And it, floating around the cabin isn't such a big problem. It's when it lands into it lands in instrumentation and gets stuck and does bad things. And as we go through the missions, as the missions get a little bit longer, the food becomes a little bit more interesting and there's a bit more variety. Um, so again, I think that's the Apollo mission stuff here. And then when we had the first of the, the banned satellites in space, the Skylab, which was I think the 1970s, crashed to Earth in Western Australia a long time ago, they actually had more sophisticated systems that allowed the astronauts to even heat the food up to make it a bit more palatable and you can see some different kinds of sources and things. So again, Skylab was a, a system that was inhabited by people for months at a time and the food needed to be a bit more interesting and I'll come back to that in a moment. To the point where on the International Space Station, because there's a lot more room, there's a lot more capacity, um, they're actually starting to send up fresh food now. So the astronauts also get, on occasion, when they have those resupply saddle, uh, ships go up, sometimes they get food from home, food that, that make them feel better about being stuck in space for 90 or 120 days at a time. And then that gets back to the question then, well, if we're providing our astronauts with fresh food, how do we assure that it's safe? And I can tell you that NASA used irradiation for a lot of those products. So if I go back, you can see that they're all in sealed containers and they're irradiated because irradiation is one of the best technologies we have for killing bad bacteria in foods. But as I said, some of those things can't be irradiated. And we're starting to get to, to fresh foods that are available on the space station. A lot of variety, they get fresh fruit and veg and so on. You think, well, hang on. How do we now assure that the food that's going up that hasn't been irradiated is safe for the astronauts to eat. 
And the differentiation is that it doesn't matter so much anymore because the space station's actually big enough to have toilets. And you think about that for a while and you think, well, hang on, you're still in zero gravity. How do you get things to go in the direction you'd like them to go? Well, there's a series of tubes that connect intimately to various parts of your body. And for the, the sitting down functions, there's a gentle draft that blows downwards and draws the material away from your body when you go to the toilet. Now that's fairly gross stuff, but I, I'll bring something else into that, and that is the longest serving commander on the International Space Station was a guy called Chris Hadfield, who's had an amazing life and an amazing career. He manages to be a nice family man. He does all the right things. And when he left the space station after that mission, which I think was five or six months, he finished it off. He took his guitar up with him when he came. And he did the um, ground control to Major Tom, so David Bowie's Space Odyssey. He recorded that in space, and that was part of his mission as well. What was really special about Chris was, though, he was a great science communicator as well. So he would regularly do live-to-air chats with school kids and people around the world, telling them about life on the International Space Station. So he was a great communicator. So if you get a chance, there are videos that actually talk about the space toilet and some of the more mechanical aspects of what it's like to live on a space station and deal with your body functions. And there are these videos you can find on the NASA sites that talk about some of the, the more interesting and, and unusual aspects of life in, in a weightless situation. But he also points out that there's something quite interesting that happens to the, the human waste that goes through the space station, and it's worth capturing or listening to that video to find out. It'll um, completely change your view of sh shooting stars. But so there's a little bit more to it than that. So we've got people living on the space station, that's okay, we can send food up to them fairly regularly. And they might be there for a year. So there's other things that come into play now. But the, the one that's of really greater interest is this. And some of you may have seen a film recently called The Martian. And it actually captures a lot of the issues around providing food to people on long haul space missions. So a lot of the science that was presented in the Martian was actually right and it was good fun to watch. And the sorts of things that um, uh, that, that, that astronaut who'd been abandoned on Mars for a very long time was doing are the sorts of things that NASA scientists are looking at doing to actually provide food for these long haul space missions because those missions could be as long as 18 to 24 to 36 months or even longer. And so what you need to do is somehow give enough food for a team of perhaps five or six astronauts to send them all the way to Mars. They might want to stay there for quite a while and then bring them back. And so currently our capacity to make good, wholesome, nutritious food is limited to foods that only are good for about two to three years. And they're canned foods and they're bland and they're boring and they're not much fun. So part of the idea is, is it possible to start cultivating fresh food when they get to Mars because that would supplement their food supply. But again, the issues are if you've got to send up three years worth of food or even five years worth of food with a group of six or eight astronauts to eat while they're travelling to and from Mars and not really being sure if they can actually produce their own food when they get there, there are some real limits about the size and space and weight that that amount of food takes up. And it's considered that to provision the, um, the Mars mission might take six to ten tonnes of food. And you have to get that all out of the Earth and out of the Earth's gravity. So it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of go. And so these are real constraints to what can you actually do to beat the laws of physics, if you like. Another consideration is, do you have to keep it refrigerated? Because refrigeration is our best food preservation technology. Um, it slows down the rate of, rate of all chemical processes and it's a good thing to do, but if you have to provide refrigeration, it takes energy. So fortunately, some of the engineers and scientists have thought, well, hang on, space is really cold. Why don't we just put the food on the outside where it's at minus 80 degrees, and maybe that's the preservation system we need. And so that's starting to be looked at again fairly seriously now. So you don't need refrigerators, you keep the food cold, and that tends to preserve the quality of the food but it still has to be safe before you start. And another aspect is that, in general, it's considered not very nice to throw rubbish out into space, and so most of the packaging that might be required has to stay with the ship and becomes a continuing part of the weight process or the weight challenges of getting the stuff out of Earth's gravity, sending to Mars and bringing it all back for proper disposal. And again, the challenges are that if food has to be prepared for a mission that might be three or five years long, 
We don't currently have the technology to be able to do that in a way that's safe and nutritious. So I'm going to deviate again for a minute and say one of the interesting new things that's happened on the International Space Station is they've now got um, a zero gravity espresso machine. And you might ask yourself, well, why the hell do they really need an espresso machine on the space station? And it goes back to something I commented on before. And that is that being away from home for a long time and having to eat the same food for long periods of time can actually lead to some psychological distress. It happens in the military that soldiers who have really intensive operations who go out in the field um, in high energy demanding situations have ration packs that are designed to provide all their needs but they get bored with them within a day or two and they start to swap them for local foods, which isn't really what the scientists and the nutritionists had in mind. And the same sort of issue comes up with people who, again, are away from home for a long time. It turns out that the psychology of food and eating is really important to keeping people's spirits up. Providing them with interesting, fresh food, diverse food, is really important, as is getting together and sharing meals. So in fact, it turns out on the space station that there's a bit of a process of making sure that people do eat together because that's one of the critical components of maintaining the crew's mental health. So now we've got some more challenges. Not only can we send up food that's, well, not, sorry, we can no longer send up food that's dehydrated because it weighs less. We actually want to try and give these um, astronauts something relatively fresh as well. And so the paradox is, we need longer shelf life product than we've ever used on Earth. We know that there will be loss of quality and nutrients over time unless we come up with new technologies or new storage systems, which means it'll be less acceptable and there might be issues about the mental health of the crew on these long haul flights unless we provide them with some of these creature comforts. And as I said, that also applies to soldiers in um, missions um, on Earth. And so the same sorts of technologies and ideas are being explored by both teams of food scientists. And again, there's this issue of, well, to keep the food safe and fresh and all those characteristics might take more packaging. And so that presents another challenge. So again, how do you provide safe, nutritious, palatable food for a Mars mission? Well... It's not as easy as having a hyperspace market. Although this is a cute photo, it's not going to work like that. So the challenges are new technologies. And so again, there are engineers, scientists, um, entrepreneurs around the world trying to come up with new ways of producing safe food that still retains its quality. As I said, cooking food is basically the safest thing we can do. Cooking it in its final container provides a way of killing off all those bad bacteria, but it also degrades the quality of the product. You lose colour, you lose aroma. So what we're looking for is a way to get that same heating, but without doing as much damage to the food. And so there's a couple of new technologies that are being experimented with that achieve that. You can heat the food up very quickly to the point where it kills the bad bacteria, and then you cool it down again, and hopefully it's as safe as other foods that have been canned, but you don't get the loss of quality, the loss of aroma and flavour and so on, so on that you do with normal um, canning and bottling processes. So they're being explored with, but because they're new technologies, we also need to go back and think, do all those bacteria that we know about respond to these technologies in the same way that they do to heat? And so again, there's an ongoing challenge about understanding for each individual bacterium, each different kind that might be able to cause food poisoning, how do they respond to these technologies and what do they do? It's interesting too, though, that that second one, the microwave, excuse me, microwave assisted thermal sterilisation is actually being explored um, for use in um, civilian foods as well. And so there's a, a MATS system that's about to be installed um, through the university at Launceston in Tasmania um, in co collaboration with the Defence Sciences Technology Organisation at Scottsdale. So the defence science people are interested in it for making more interesting foods for their, their soldiers on those, those missions where they need more interesting, more nutritious foods. Um, but there's also a commercial spin-off. That is, consumers get the benefit of a higher quality product um, that still is safe. So again, spin-offs from the space program are now translating into the foods that we eat. And then there's this third aspect of it as well, which is that can you grow some of the food on board? And so there are experiments being done in the International Space Station now that look at what happens when you try and grow food in space. And so you can see one of the astronauts there playing with a, a kind of lettuce that has been grown in the International Space Station. 
Now, it also provides a few other benefits, and again, if you've ever watched any science fiction movies where people live on a space station for a long time, there's often a greenhouse set up because they can use it for filtering and cleaning up some of the water, they can use it for cleaning up some of the other waste that's produced on the, the, the long missions, and they can use it to regenerate oxygen from the CO2 that the astronauts are breathing. So it's got a number of benefits. The things are, though, can it work? But remembering that to grow those plants, you usually have to grow them in soil. So now we need to have a sterile system to start with because we go back to the same problem of if you grow the food in the space station in a natural system, how do, you, how do we make sure that that food retains its safety um, and doesn't cause, cause foodborne disease? Because all soils potentially contain um, food poisoning bacteria. So the trick is that they make a sterilised seed and they insert it inside a sterilised soil substitute and stick it in a little foil pack. And so that's what you see happening there. So you can water into that soil pack the seed um, germinates, it starts to grow, and provided that you give it the right sort of light, and this is done with LEDs of different colours so that the plant gets the right mixture of light colours, you can actually set up a little greenhouse in space. And again, this is an experimental trial, I think, from the International Space Station, studying how to be able to grow food on those long-haul space missions because that is one of the solutions to the problem, being able to make new food rather than taking all the food with you. And it gets intensified to things like this. So this is another system where you've got a bunch of guys dressed up as though they're in a hospital operating theatre because this is a pretty sterile environment. This is where they're preparing those little sachets of sterile seeds in sterile soil to go into space so we can have safe foods growing in a space system. And that starts to look a bit interesting because, wow, is that technology also transferable to the production of safe salads for people that live on the earth because one of the challenges here is again here's rocket here's rocket growing just near hobart at euston's farm and it grows in soil and if you look around in the background of the picture you'll see there's trees and open land and if you can imagine it there's birds and there's australian native animals and there's amphibians and there's things there down by the dam and all of those things have the potential to carry pathogenic bacteria in their guts and to spread those pathogenic bacteria by browsing around in the, in the, the fields where these salad products are growing. So there's the risk from the soil, there's the risk from accidental contamination from the faeces of animals in the environment, and it's very hard to clean up delicate salad vegetables. You can't eat them because then they're rubbish. There's not much you can do to disinfect them. In fact, there's very little treatments that we have available. And the challenge with these products is, because they're ready to eat, how do you assure that they're safe at the same time? And it really is a challenge. And so most of the, the safety of these products comes from monitoring the environment and keeping the environment as clean and free from contamination as possible, but it's also a relatively weak link in this process. So as I said, these are grown in natural environments. They travel around the country for 10 to 14 days before we buy them in a supermarket. We don't do anything to them that would eliminate any pathogenic bacteria. So all the onus is back on the production and the packaging steps. And again, there's really not much you can do to a product that's as delicate as this to render it safe. So maybe, maybe those space systems where you start with an enclosed environment with sterile soil with a sterile seed, maybe that's part of the solution to um, consumers on Earth as well. And just to highlight, though, the extent to which salad vegetable producers will go, this is a picture of someone working in the, the food processing facility at Euston's Farms, and they're actually not wearing most of the gear that most of the people in that factory environment wear. Normally they'll have a face mask on as well. Normally they'll be wearing surgical gloves too. They use more sanitizers and hand sanitizers than most of us wash our hands at home. It's a very clean operation because the people themselves are a potential source of contamination too. And so these are called high-risk products and the level of control of those environments is also at a very, very high level. Again, kind of similar to the level of control that happens in an operating th uh, theatre in a hospital. So again, there are some analogies here too. And again, it's possible then that maybe, maybe part of the solution to that is that we need to do these vegetable factories. Or maybe we just need to be a little bit smarter about how we control the environment. Nonetheless, there's another opportunity there, if, if you like, for some of the spin-offs of, of the, the space program coming back and influencing the way that we 
produce foods and the sort of way that we buy foods and the sort of things that we use to process foods here on Earth. Things that will have beneficial spin-offs um, for our food safety on Earth as well. So, that's about the end of the story and I think I hope to have made some analogies and some linkages between the food safety that we enjoy and, and the improved food safety we might hope to enjoy as a function of some of the things that we've learned through the space programs, but in particular the needs of food safety and food preservation for the, the space program itself, both to keep astronauts happy and healthy, but also um, to provide nutritious and interesting mood, uh, foods along the way. So again, I think modern food safety management has learned much from rocket science in particular these management strategies and also some of the ex existing technologies that have been developed for space foods and some of the new technologies that are being developed as well. Again, you say, well that all sounds fairly easy but still we need that detailed understanding of microbial ecology and physiology because of the diversity of these foodborne pathogens that can be present in foods and that can make us sick. And so with that, I'd like to thank Alison Clark from Euston Farms as well, who provided some of the slides when we did a presentation like this together, and one of my current students, Zoe Bartlett, who was part of Science Week, gave a similar sort of presentation in Strawn as well. So I've taken some of their content and added it to my slides as well. So thank you, um, Dougald and others, and thank you, people who are out there listening. Um, thanks for your attention. I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Tom. That was certainly fascinating and, and got me thinking, and I'm sure everyone who's been listening in to that webinar uh, has been thinking about some of the uh, fascinating content of that, that, that webinar presentation. And uh, with all that thinking, naturally has arisen some questions from, questions from some of the curious, uh, some of those curious in the audience. So um, we've got time for, for 10 minutes or so of questions. So. Um, we can go through these questions and uh, to start off with I'll, I'll uh, put to you uh, that different bacteria can cause different severity of illness. Can you elaborate on how we can judge which are worse than others? Um, not sure what the question means but certainly you're correct. Different bacteria typically are associated with illness of different severity. Um, how can we tell the difference? Um, mainly by experience um, and that is we know that certain kinds of bacteria produce different kinds of illness so we have vomiting from Staphylococcus aureus that's often present in foods it's a common contaminant of people's skin um, if it gets into foods and the foods are stored at the wrong temperature that can grow as it grows it produces a toxin and the toxin reacts with our nervous system and causes us to vomit as a reflex I guess to get rid of the toxin that's in your, your stomach and that passes fairly quickly. It's not pleasant, but usually within two to six hours you're over it. Then you have things like campylobacteriosis, and that's again quite a common illness in Australia, and it's actually the most uh, frequently reported foodborne illness in most Western countries now. Um, often associated with raw chickens, um, it's just part of their, their normal gut um, bacteria, but it makes us sick if we get it in the wrong quantities. And that causes a diarrhoea and vomiting and nausea and stuff that makes you feel miserable for about seven to ten days typically, but then it goes away. Um, there's a, a disease that's quite rare called listeriosis. Um, it's mostly um, important to people who have compromised immune systems, people who are very young. Pregnant mums are in that situation because the uterus is a immuno... Well, it's, it's, it, the level of immunity there is reduced because there are shared genes from the father of the baby as well, and so the immune system has to deal differently with that. Um, as people get older, their immune systems um, start to, to decrease in, in effectiveness as well. And there's a whole bunch of people out there on different drug therapies that try and suppress their immune system so that they don't, for example, reject transplants or people who've had AIDS. Those people are particularly susceptible to listeriosis. And so there are warnings given to people, particularly pregnant mothers, to say, if you're pregnant, try and avoid these foods because these are the ones that are more likely to have that bacteria in them. And so that disease can last for weeks, put you in hospital, but it can also cause spontaneous abortions. And in fact, those who get serious listeriosis, there's about 150 of those a year, perhaps 20 to 30 of those per year in Australia will die from that disease. But it's rarer. Mm -hmm. And it's probably rarer because we know how dangerous it is and so the food industry spends a lot of energy making sure that it's not present in our foods. Mm -hmm. And perhaps the most severe one of all is Clostridium botulinum. It produces the same toxin that we use for Botox, that cosmetic treatment. It's the most 
potent toxin known on the planet, at least by a hundredfold more toxic than anything else we know. And it can grow in um, foods that have been heat treated but not sufficiently or if they get recontaminated. And as it grows, it produces a toxin, but it produces no other signs. But all of these things we know about, we've learnt by hard experience, if you like. Then we go and see what caused it. We learn about the bacteria and then we work out ways to stop that from happening again. More recently, though, as our, our ability to do molecular biology, to look at the gene genetic structure of organisms has increased enormously in the last 20 years, we can now look directly at the genetic makeup of an organism and say, oh, we can see that in that genetic makeup there are genes that code for particular toxins or particular um, proteins that help that organism to become a pathogen. So our capacity now to look at a, a particular strain of bacteria, look at its genetic makeup and say, oh, it, it has all the hallmarks of being a pathogen, um, have also increased. So I hope that answered, if you like, both aspects of the question. Yeah, thanks, Tom. I think probably it's worth just adding that um, in terms of judging or testing what is causing an illness. We do have some classical but yet useful and accurate methods that are routinely applied by yep. pathology labs when yep. sent samples by GPs and other yeah, specialists. Yeah, and again, so there's a number of things. If someone presents with an illness and you, the, 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 the treating physician would look at the range of um, symptoms they have and say, oh, this could be one of half a dozen different kinds of organism, we'll do tests specifically mm -hmm. in their their, their faeces if they've got diarrhoea, um, we'll, we'll look in their blood for signs of an infection so there'll be particular antibodies expressed. Um, and those technologies have improved a lot again because we can use genetic technologies to build detection systems that are quicker and more sensitive as well. But again, the experience says, oh, it looks like it's this disease, we should test for this range of organisms in that person's blood or in that person's faeces and so on. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we've got another question here. So. It's around chemicals causing illness, particularly preservatives and residues. You mentioned the melanin example um, and mentioned that was quite rare in practice. I guess it depends what kind of illness we're talking about here because, of, of course, there's allergies and various intolerances to preservatives, etc. Is that um, something you could comment on or yep. provide extra perspective on? Um, that's, that's a fair comment and a fair question. Allergenicity... Um, is well recognised now and we know that there's 9 or 10 or 15 foodborne proteins that are just normal components of food and some people have allergies to them. And so the way that we deal with that in the food industry is to be very aware of those potential sources in the food and to make it clear with labelling that the foods do contain or may have been exposed to those allergens that may make people particularly sick. The thing with allergens is because they're chemicals they're a bit easier to test for and if you think about the, the comparison is like if we're looking for a, a chemical toxin in a food we might be looking for billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of molecules before they're present in a concentration that's likely to harm anyone. On the other hand when we're looking at a bacterium we're just looking for one potentially in 25 grams of food and that's the challenge so that the, the chemical tends to be spread throughout it's easier to find them because they're mixed through the food the bacteria is harder to find, but we can still detect it. So going back, because we have good technologies for testing for chemical residues, it's more, uh, it's more relevant to, to a testing strategy rather I mean, again, the food industry tries to be preventative. It tries to make sure that it knows what it's adding and it labels appropriately when particular mm -hmm. preservatives are applied to food and so on. So again, it just it's more predictable because usually those chemicals, if they're present, are deliberately added. Mm. Whereas the bacteria, you've got much less control over where they're coming mm. from and that's why the management required is different. Does that answer yeah, the question? I think it does, thanks Tom. And I might just put in a plug for Australian growers and producers out there. And one of the things uh, we have in Australia is a very strong regulatory environment, of course, around food safety, particularly when it comes to chemicals and residues. So that if you know the provenance of your food and it's coming from Australia, you can be very very assured that uh, there aren't going to be issues with uh, preservatives uh, or chemical residues, I should say, um, whereas you don't necessarily have that same uh, surety on food that's coming from overseas that might not have the same strict uh, policies and procedures around its production. Yeah. Uh, the next question around the use of antibiotics in production. Does this make the issue of food safety more complex? 
So I'm assuming you're referring to the use of antibiotics as a preventative for mm. animal health with some of the animal production systems. Does that impact on food safety, sort of shelf life, issues like that? No, it shouldn't because the, the concern about use of antibiotics in animal production mainly relates to um, a concern that it might lead to antibiotic resistant mm. pathogens that could then infect people and the antibiotics are then less effective when they have to deal with an infection in the people. The mm. residue should never be transferred to the food itself because as Dougald commented on, there are withholding periods. Um, so that, uh, for example, if there's a dairy cow that it's got mastitis or an infection of the teat and it needs antibiotics, it's taken out of the milking system and it's, it's kept out of the milking system for a period of time after the antibiotic treatment is finished. So there's a high level of awareness, particularly in developed countries, about the issues of antibiotic residues ending up in foods, um, and that's dealt with by withholding periods, very tight control over the use of those antibiotics, um, and testing as well. Um, as I said in the second question about um, that the potential for development of antibiotic resistant bacteria that become human pathogens remains unresolved. It's a concern, but there's currently no strong evidence for it. Um, in general, in Australia, we don't like to use antibiotics, even in food production systems. It's maybe used in the poultry industry, it's maybe being used in the pork industry, it tends not to be used in dairy or um, cattle production or sheep production. Um, and we wouldn't, you certainly don't add them to foods for that reason that some people are also allergic to them and have bad reactions. Mm. Um, I've got a question on my own, which uh, I'm going to ask since I'm chairing this. Um, you mentioned sterilisation a couple of times. Um, now, there are various means of sterilising both seed, substrate, foods, um, and they range from simply hot water, very high temperatures, high pressures. Um, presumably there are other chemical methods sometimes used, like weak acids. Um, what Do you have just some comments on so the prevalence, the main um, effectors, if you like, of sterilisation? Yeah, OK. The, the first comment would be that sterilisation by definition means elimination of all viable microorganisms on the food. And not all of those methods that you mentioned do actually achieve sterilisation. Some of them just sorry, achieve disinfection or sanitation. So it depends on the intended use of the food, how long it'll be kept for, the extent to which you have to eliminate all the bacteria. But for the longer shelf life foods, the things that are in cans and bottles and so on, we expect them to be shelf stable for a couple of years, they tend to need to be sterilised and they get the most severe treatments. And so there's a whole um, sequence of times and temperatures that are known and used in the industry that pretty much guarantee sterility. But heating for a long period of time is about the only method that can guarantee sterilisation. Everything else produces a product that is safe enough within its intended use or shelf life um, that it doesn't present a risk to the consumer. So chemicals tend to be the least effective. So again, in the case of the salad vegetables, they use an organic acid rinse. The contact time is perhaps one minute and it's cold, so it doesn't have much chemical reactivity, but that's the best we've got without doing more damage to the plant tissue itself than making the product safe. Mm -hmm. um, in the meat industry and poultry industry, they tend to use chlorine, or chlorine, so chemical disinfectants in baths, and the material gets dipped through that, and that, again, provides a disinfection. It reduces the risk of bad bacteria being there, but the product certainly isn't sterile. So when I commented about raw meat, raw fish, raw poultry, they are produced under very clean conditions. Some of them, particularly the smaller portions, will get disinfected as part of their processing. Um, but they still carry the risk, and that's why we typically cook food. One is it tastes better, but the other reason is it's a safety margin as well that's provided. So again, that's the reason why you have to be careful about not cross-contaminating. Um, you've talked about high pressure, so that's another method, but it doesn't achieve sterility, but it's more powerful in killing off bacteria than chemical disinfectants and so on. So there's a gradation of technologies. With them are uh, costs associated with building the equipment and putting material through them. And so there's, there's a trade-off between the cost of the product, its intended use, um, and the sort of technology that you need to achieve the level of cleanliness that still provides a very high level of certainty that the product will be safe to consume when it's consumed. Mm -hmm. But again, some products are raw and they're expected that they'll be cooked and they need to be cooked in the home as well. Okay. Thanks, Tom. That, that's a great comprehensive answer to that question. I'm not going to ask any more questions after that answer. But we do have a final question from someone in the audience out there. 
Um, so you, you talked about heating, and you have talked about the issue with, with you know, limited options with um, fresh leafy greens. So this question is: How effective is simply washing salad vegetables with tap water? Given that that's what most of us will do at home once we get it from the supermarket and having our salad, which of course is uncooked. So how effective is that, Tom? Any comments around? Yeah, that, that's that? an interesting question. I'm, I'm going to revisit the last question as well because I forgot to mention irradiation. Irradiation as a technology is also very effective. It's very good at killing bad bacteria, even the most resistant ones, and it tends not to do too much damage to the product. Mm. The trouble is nobody trusts it, mm. um, which is un, a little bit sad. It's also a relatively costly technology, mm. but it doesn't actually make the food unsafe. And in fact, if you wanted to make lettuce products much, much safer, you would probably irradiate them. Mm. However, going back, in general, lettuce products don't cause much disease as far as we know. It's a relatively short shelf life mm. and the chemical disinfection and the washing that they do in the factory actually does most of the work for us. Mm. Now, in the factory they go through, I think, one wash step, which is a big bath with water, uh, drinking quality water. Then they go through a second bath that's got some disinfectant added, a, a, an organic acid, and then they go through another bath after that. So that by the time it's got through that, you've actually reduced the microbial load on that product by 10 to 100 times. And it's in actually pretty good nick. Now, to go to the second part of the question, if you buy that product, you'll notice that it says on the bag, this has been washed to be ready to eat. And out of the United States at the moment, the health authorities there are saying, actually, that's true. You're actually better off not washing the salad vegetables that you buy in the pre bag product in your own kitchen sink, because your kitchen sink is probably much, much dirtier than the factory where those products were originally made. So if it says this has been washed for your safety and it's ready to use, you can take that as truth. You'll probably do more harm than good by trying to wash it again. So again, that's for the bag product maybe not so much for the loose leaf product. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Thank Tom. Uh, with the irradiation, I'll just add a final. So we do have commercial scale irradiation of fruit here in Australia, particularly focused on fruit for various export markets. Okay. Many countries simply won't accept irradiation as a method of sterilisation, even though it's perfectly safe, uh, as opposed to other countries which are very comfortable with it. Um, and an example of that is uh, New Zealand, accepting our mangoes that have been irradiated. So I think it's an interesting... Uh, cultural, social issue around uh, irradiation. Yes. But one thing I think is for certain is that we'll see more irradiation in the future. Yeah. It's all good. Okay. Well, look, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll wrap up things, I think, given, given the time that we've uh, arrived at. So I'd like to very much thank, thank you, Tom, for that extremely engaging and insightful presentation. I'd like to thank the audience for being part of uh, the University of Tasmania's third alumni webinar. And I'd like to wish everyone a good day for the rest of the day. Um, the entire webinar has been recorded. We will be sending you a link to the recording in the coming days, so look out for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Sigal. Thanks, Sigal. Thanks, Sigal. Thanks, Sigal.